Okay, so year eights, we're going to be carrying on with War Horse today. We're looking at chapters 16 and 17. And then next week, in the last week of term, we'll have two reading lessons. So we'll get the book finished next week. From both sides of me, I heard a gradual crescendo of excitement and laughter rippling along the trenches, interspersed with barked orders that everyone was to keep their heads down and no one was to shoot. From my vantage point on the mound, I could only see an occasional glimpse of a steel helmet, my only evidence that the voices I was hearing did indeed belong to real people. There was a sweet smell of cooking food wafting towards me, and I lifted my nose to savour it. It was sweeter than the sweetest bran mash I'd ever tasted, and it had a tinge of salt about it. I was drawn first one way and then the other by this promise of warm food, but each time I neared the trenches on either side I met, met an impenetrable barrier of loosely coiled barbed wire. The soldiers cheered me on as I came closer, showing their heads fully now over the trenches and beckoning me towards them. And when I had to turn back at the wire and cross no man's land to the other side, I was welcomed again, there by a chorus of whistling and clapping. But again I could find no way through the wire. I must have crisscrossed no man's land for much of that morning, and found at long last in the middle of the blasted wilderness a small patch of coarse, dank grass growing on the lip of an outer crater. I was busying myself at tearing the last of this away, when I saw out of the corner of my eye a man in a grey uniform clamber up out of the trenches, waving a white flag above his head. I looked up as he began to clip his way methodically through the wire and then pull it aside. All this time there was much argument and noisy consternation from the other side, and soon a small helmeted figure in a flapping khaki grey coat climbed up into no man's land. He too held up a white handkerchief in one hand and began also to work his way through the wire towards me. The German was through the wire first, leaving a narrow gap behind him. He approached me slowly across no man's land, calling out to me all the while to come towards him. He reminded me at once of dear old Friedrich, for he was, like Friedrich, a grey-haired man in an untidy, unbuttoned uniform, and he spoke gently to me. In one hand he held a rope, the other he stretched out towards me. He was still far too far away for me to see clearly, but an offered hand in my experience was often cupped and there was enough promise in that for me to limp cautiously towards him. On both sides the trenches were lined now with cheering men, standing on the parapets waving their helmets above their heads. Oi, oi -o! The shout came from behind me and was urgent enough for, to stop me. I turned to see the small man in khaki weaving and jinking his way across no man's land. One hand held high above his head carrying the white handkerchief. Oi, boyo, where are you going? Hang on a bit. You're going, to the wrong, you're going the wrong way, see? The two men who were coming towards me could not have been more different. The one in grey was the taller of the two, and as he came nearer, I could see his face was lined and creased with years. Everything about him was slow and gentle under his ill-fitting uniform. He wore no helmet, but instead the peakless cap with the red beret I knew so well sitting carelessly on the back of his head. The little man in khaki reached us out of breath, his face red and still smooth with youth his round helmet with the broad rim fallen askew over one ear. For a few strained, silent moments, the two stood yards apart from each other, eyeing one another wearily, not saying a word. I, it was the young man in khaki who broke the silence and spoke first. Now what do we do? he said, walking towards us and looking at the German who stood head and shoulders above him. There's two of us here and one horse to split between us. Of course, King Solomon had the answer, didn't he now? But it's not very practical in this case, is it? And what's worse, I can't speak a word of German and I can see you can't understand what the hell I'm talking about, can you? Oh, hell, I should never have come out here. I knew I shouldn't. Can't think what came over me. And all for, the, for a muddy old horse, too. But I can, I can speak a little bad English, said the older man, still holding out his cupped hand under my nose. It was full of black bread, broken into pieces, a tidbit I was familiar enough with, but usually found too bitter for my taste. However, I was now too hungry to be choosy, and as he was speaking, 
I soon emptied his hand. I speak only a little English, like a schoolboy, but it's enough, I think, for us. And even as he spoke, I felt a rope slip slowly round my neck and tighten. As for our other problem, since I have been here the first, then the horse is mine. Fair? No? Like your cricket? 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 said the young man. Who's ever heard of that barbarous game in Wales? That's a game for the rotten English. Rugby, that's my game, and that's not a game. That's a religion, that is, where I come from. I played scrum half for my steg before the war stopped me, and at my steg we say that a loose ball is our ball. Sorry, said the German, his eyebrows furrowed with concern. I cannot understand what you mean by this. Doesn't matter, Jerry, not important, not any more. We could have settled all this peaceful like, Jerry, the war I mean, and I'd be back in my valley and you'd be back in yours. Still, not your fault, I don't suppose, nor mine, neither, come to that. By now, the cheering for both sides had subsided, and both armies looked on in total silence as the two men talked together beside me. The Welshman was stroking my nose and feeling my ears. You know horses, then, said the tall German. How bad is his wounded leg? Is it broken, do you think? He seems not to walk on it. The Welshman bent over and lifted my leg gently and expertly, wiping away the mud from around the wound. He's in a mess right enough, but I don't think it's broken, Jerry. It's a bad wound, though. A deep gash. Wire, by the look of it. Got to get him seen to quick, else the poison will set in, and then there won't be a lot anyone could do for him. Cut like that, he must have lost a lot of blood already. Question is, though, who takes him? We've got a veterinary hospital somewhere back behind our lines that, I could, that could take care of him, but I expect you've got one too. Yes, I think so. Somewhere it must be. But I do not know exactly where, the German said slowly. And then he dug deep in his pocket and produced a coin. You choose the side you want, head or tail, I think you say. I will show the coin to everyone on both sides and everyone will know that whichever side wins the horse wins the horse it is only by chance then no one loses any pride yes and everyone will be happy the welshman looked up admiringly and smiled all right then you go ahead jerry you show them the coin and then you toss and i'll call the german held the coin up in the sun and then turned a full full slow circle before spinning it high and glinting into the air as it fell to the ground, the Welshman called out in a loud, resonant voice so that all the world could hear, Heads! Well, said the German, stooping to pick it up, that's the face of my Kaiser looking up at me out of the mud, and he does not look pleased with me, so I'm afraid you have won. The horse is yours. Take good care of him, my friend. And he picked up the rope again and handed it to the Welshman. As he did so, he held out his other hand in a gesture of friendship and reconciliation, a smile lighting his worn face. In an hour, maybe, or two, he said, we'll be trying our best again to kill each other. God only knows why we do it. And I think he has maybe forgotten why. Goodbye, Welshman. We have shown them, haven't we? We have shown them that any problem can be solved between people if only they can trust each other. That is all it needs, no? The little Welshman shook his head in disbelief as he took the rope. Jerry Boyo, I think if they would let you and me have an hour or two together here, we could sort out this whole wretched mess. There'd be no more weeping widows and crying children in my valley and no more in yours. If the worst came to the worst, we could decide it all on the flip of a coin, couldn't we now? If we did, said the German with a chuckle, if we did it that way, then it would be our turn to win. And maybe your Lloyd George would not like that. And he put his hand on the Welshman's shoulders for a moment. Take care, my friend, and good luck. I'll feed the same. And he turned away and walked slowly back across no man's land to the wire. Same to you, boyo, the Welshman shouted after him. And then he too turned and led me away back towards the line of khaki soldiers who began now to laugh and cheer with delight as I limped toward them through the gap in the wire. It was only with the greatest difficulty that I stayed standing on my three good legs in the veterinary wagon that carried me that morning away from the heroic little Welshman who had brought me in. A milling crowd of soldiers surrounded me to cheer me on my way. 
but out on the long rattling roads, I was soon very shaken off my balance and fell in an ungainly uncomfortable heap on the floor of the wagon. My injured leg throbbed terribly as the wagon rocked from side to side on its slow journey away from the battlefront. The wagon was drawn by two stocky black horses, both well groomed out and immaculate in well-oiled harness. Weakened by long hours of pain and starvation, I had not enough strength even to get onto my feet when I felt the wheels below me running at last on smooth cobblestones and the wagon came to a jerking standstill in the warm, pale autumn sunshine. My arrival was greeted by a chorus of excited neighing and I raised my head to look. I could just see over the sideboards a wide cobbled courtyard with magnificent stables on either side and a great horse with turrets beyond. Over every stable door were the heads of inquisitive horses, ears pricked. There were men in khaki walking everywhere, and a few were running now towards me, one of them carrying a rope halter. Unloading was painful, for I had little strength left, and my legs had gone numb after the long journey. But they got me to my feet and walked me backwards gently down the ramp. I found myself the centre of anxious and admiring attention in the middle of the courtyard, surrounded by a cluster of soldiers who inspected minutely every part of me, feeling me all over. What in thunder do you think you're about, you lot? came a booming voice echoing across the courtyard. It's an horse! It's an horse, just like the others! A huge man was striding towards us, his boots crisp on the cobbles his heavy red face half hidden by the shade of his peaked cap that almost touched his nose and by a ginger moustache that spread upwards from his lips to his ears. It may be a famous horse. It may be the only thundering horse in the old thundering war bought in a life from no man's land. But it is only an horse and a dirty horse at that. I've had some rough looking specimens bought in here in my time, but this is the scruffiest, dirtiest, muddiest horse I've ever seen. He's a thundering disgrace, and you're all stood about looking at him. He wore three broad stripes on his arm, and the creases in his immaculate khaki uniform were razor sharp. Now there's a hundred or more sick horses here in this hospital, and there's just twelve of us to look after them. This here young layabout was detailed to look after this one when he arrived, so the rest of you blighters can get back to your duties. Move it, you idle monkeys, move it! And the men scattered in all directions, leaving me with a young soldier who began to lead me away towards the stable. And you, came that booming voice again, Major Martin will be down from the house in ten minutes to examine that horse. Make sure that horse is so thundering clean and thundering shiny so you could use him as a shaving mirror, right? Yes, Sergeant, came the reply, a reply that sent a sudden shiver of recognition through me. Quite where I'd heard the voice before, I did not know. I knew only that those two words sent a tremor of joy and hope and expectation through my body and warmed me from the inside out. He led me slowly across the cobbles and I tried all the while to see his face better, but he kept just that much ahead of me so that all I could see was a neatly shaven neck and a pair of pink ears. How the devil did you get yourself stuck out there in no man's land, you old silly, he said. That's what everyone wants to know since the message came back that they'd be bringing you in here. And how the devil did you get yourself in such a state? I swear there's not an inch of you that isn't covered in mud or blood. Job to tell what you look like under all that mess. Still, we'll see, see soon. I'll tie you up here and get the worst of it off in the open air. Then I'll brush you up in the proper manner before the officer gets here. Come on, you silly you. Once I've got you cleaned up, then the officer will see you and he'll tidy up the nasty cut of yours. Can't give you food, I'm sorry to say, nor any water, not till he says so. That's what the sergeant told me. That's just in case they have to operate on you. And the way he whistled as he cleaned out the brushes was a whistle that went with the voice I knew. It confirmed my rising hopes, and I knew then that I could not be mistaken. In my overwhelming delight, delight I reared up on my back legs and cried out to him to recognise me. I wanted to make him see who I was. Hey, careful there, you silly. Nearly had me hat off, he said gently, keeping a firm hold on the root rope and smoothing my nose, as he always had done whenever I was unhappy. No need for that. You'll be all right. Lot of fuss about nothing. New young horse, once just like you, 
Proper jumpy he was until I got to know him, and he got to know me. You talking to them horses again, Albert? Came a voice from inside the next stable. God's truth, what makes you think they'll understand a perishing word you say? Some of them may not, David, said Albert, but one day, one day one of them will. He'll come in here and he'll recognise my voice. He's bound to come in here, and then you'll see a horse that understands every word that's said to him. You're not on about your Joey again. The head that came with the voice leant out of the stable door. Will you never give it up, Bertie? I've told you before if I've told you a thousand times. They say there's near half a million ruddy horses out here and you join the veterinary corps just, to, just on the off chance you might come across him. I pawed the ground with my bad leg in an effort to make Albert look at me more closely, but he just patted my neck and set to work cleaning me up. There's just a one in a half million that your Joey walks in here. You've got to be more realistic. He could be dead. A lot of them are. He could have gone off to ruddy Palestine and with the yeoman tree. He could be anywhere amongst hundreds of miles of trenches. If you weren't so ruddy good with horses, and if you weren't the best friend I had, I'd think you'd gone and gone a bit screwy at the way you go on about your Joey. You'll understand why when you see him, David, Albert said, crouching down to scrape the caked mud off my underside. You'll see. There's no horse like him anywhere in the whole world. He's a bright red bay with a black mane and tail. He has a white cross on his forehead and four white socks that are all even to the last inch. He stands over 16 hands and he's perfect from head to tail. I can tell you, I can tell you that when you see him, you'll know him. I could pick him out in a crowd of a thousand horses. There's just something about him. Captain Nichols, you know, him that's dead now, the one I told you about that brought Joey for my father. Him that sent me Joey's picture. He knew it. He saw it the first time he set eyes on him. I'll find him, David. That's what I came all this way for, and I'm going to find him. Either I'll find him, or he'll find me. I told you. I made him a promise, and I'm going to keep it. You're round the ruddy twist, Bertie, said his friend, opening a stable door and coming over to examine my leg. Round the ruddy twist, that's all I can say. He picked up my hoof and lifted it gently. This one's got a white sock on his front legs anyway. That's as far as I can tell under all the blood and mud. I'll just sponge the wound away a bit and clean it up for you whilst I'm here. You'll never get this one cleaned up in time else. And I've finished mucking out my ruddy stables. Not a lot else to do. And it looks as though you could, you could do with a hand. Old Sergeant Thunder won't mind. Not if I've done it all he told me. And I have. The two men worked tirelessly on me, scraping and brushing and washing. I stood quite still, trying only to nuzzle Albert to make him turn and look at me, but he was busying at my tail and my hindquarters now. Three, said his friend, washing off another of my hooves. That's three white socks. Turn it up, David, said Albert. I know what you think. I know everyone thinks I'll never find him. There's thousands of army horses with four white socks, I know that but there's only one with a blaze in the shape of a cross on the forehead, and how many horses shine red like, like fire in the evening sun? I tell you, there's not another one like him, not in the whole world. Four, said David, that's four legs and four white socks, only the cross on the forehead to find now, and a splash of red paint on this muddy mess of a horse, and you'll have your joey standing here. Don't tease, said Albert quietly. Don't tease, David. You know how serious I am about Joey. It'll mean all the world to me to find him again. Only friend I ever had before I came to the war. I told you. I grew up with him, I did. Only creature on this earth I've had any kinship for. David was standing now by my head. He lifted my mane and brushed gently at first, then vigorously on my forehead, blowing the dust away from my eyes. He peered closely and then set to again, brushing down towards the end of my nose and up again between my ears until I tossed my head with impatience. Bertie, he said quietly, I'm not teasing. Honestly, I'm not. Not now. You said your Joey had four white socks all even to the inch, right? Right, said Albert, still brushing away at my tail. And you said Joey had a white cross on his forehead. Right. Albert was still completely disinterested. Now I have never seen a horse like that, Bertie, said David, using his hand to smooth down the hair on my forehead. 
wouldn't have thought it possible. Well, it is, I tell you, said Albert sharply, and he was red, flaming red in the sunlight, like I said. I wouldn't have thought it possible, his friend went on, keeping his voice in check. Until now, that is. I'll pack it in, David, Albert said, and there was a genuine irritation in his voice now. I've told you, haven't I? I told you I'm serious about Joey. So am I, Bertie. Dead serious. No messing. I'm serious. This horse has four white socks, all evenly marked, like you said. This horse has a clear white cross on his head. This horse, as you can see for yourself, has a black mane and tail. This horse stands over 16 hands, and when he's cleaned up, he'll look pretty as a picture. And this horse is a red bay under all that mud, just like you said, Bertie. As David was speaking, Albert suddenly dropped my tail and moved slowly around me, running his hand along my back. And then at last we stood facing one another. There was a rougher hue to his face, I thought. He had more lines around his eyes and he was broader, bigger man in his uniform than I remembered him. But he was my Albert, and there was no doubt about it. He was my Albert. Joey, he said tentatively, looking into my eyes. Joey? I tossed up my head and called out to him in my happiness so that the sound echoed around the yard and brought horses and men to the door of their stables. It could be, said Albert quietly. You're right, David. It could be him. It sounds like him even. But there's one way I know to be sure. And he untied my rope and pulled a halter off my head. Then he turned and walked away from the gateway before facing me, cupping his hand to his lips and whistling. It was his owl whistle, the same low stuttering whistle he'd used to call me when we were walking out together back at home on the farm all those long years before. Suddenly there was no longer any pain in my leg and I trotted easily over toward him and buried my nose in his shoulder. It's him, David, Albert said, putting his arms around my neck and hanging onto my mane. It's my Joey, I found him. He's come back to me just like I said he would. See, said David wryly, see what did I tell you? Not often wrong, am I? Not often, Albert said, not often and not this time. So, much as the chances were against them, Albert and Joey have now found each other. So, hopefully, we're moving towards a happy ending. As I said at the beginning, four more chapters to go, so we'll have two reading lessons next week to bring us up to the end of term. We'll get the book finished then, okay? Bye.